Okay, good morning, everyone. Hope you're all uh, hope you're all well. Uh, just a reminder of where we are and where we're going. Uh, most of you are working away at uh, assignment four, which is the uh, implementing motors uh, on your robot. Uh, for those of you that have started in on motors, you'll notice it's a little bit of a shorter uh, it's a little bit of a shorter assignment this week. So I have also uh, added assignment five now a little bit early. Uh, this is where you're going to be doing some refactoring. So. Uh, for those of you that finish up assignment four early and you want to get a, a tack, you want to get started on assignment five, you can go for it. Uh, assignment five is a little bit longer. It's got 109 uh, steps. Um, there's a fair bit of object-oriented programming in assignment five. So if you're not familiar with object-oriented programming or you're a little bit rusty, I would uh, advise you to try and finish up assignment four as quickly as you can and move on to assignment five. Um, I'm not changing uh, the, the schedule at all. Assignment four is still due this coming Monday uh, at midnight, and assignment five will be due a week from Monday uh, at midnight. Any questions about the assignment so far? Everyone doing all right? Okay. All right, so um, back to our uh, relatively brief history of evolutionary robotics. As I mentioned last time, um, there were two initial experiments, both reported about the same time uh, in Europe, one by a set of Italian researchers, another one by uh, a set of English researchers. We will, uh, we're going to continue that discussion today. We didn't finish up lecture seven last time. We're a little bit behind where we should be, but that's all right. Um, we'll probably finish lecture seven today and move on to lecture uh, eight, which we will conclude next Tuesday. Okay, so lecture seven, back to the beginnings of evolutionary uh, robotics. And again, we're talking about two experiments from about the mid 90s. We started by looking at this robot, uh, at this particular robot, the Kepra robot, which is about the size of a hockey puck. Um, we saw how we can add uh, grippers or we can add simple visual systems to the Kepra robot. And we ended last time by describing the experimental setup for the first physical evolutionary robotics experiment. We had our little Kepra, they had their little Kepra sitting on uh, a table that was attached by a cable to a computer. The computer is going to evolve a population of neural networks, download each neural network by cable onto the physical Kepra, um, observe the Kepra perform some behavior, compute some fitness for that robot, how well did it do at the task, send that number back, and that number gets associated with the neural network take the second neural network, download it onto the robot, get back the fitness of that second neural network, and so on, delete the neural networks that uh, get low fitness and make randomly modified copies of the neural networks that do a little bit better. Very, very uh, simple. Um, so uh, the quiz from last time uh, asked you in the reading, uh, the reading describes this experiment. So in the uh, quiz from last time, I think I actually asked you about this fitness function. So if you did well on the quiz, this might be a little bit redundant. But uh, at a couple of points throughout this course, we're going to think about constructing fitness functions for a given behavior. As you will find out when you start to construct fitness functions for your robots, constructing a good fitness function is tricky. It's very difficult to describe what you want the robot to do without telling it exactly how to do it and get back a good behavior. Okay, so let's take a relatively simple uh, set up here. They use some uh, styrofoam pieces here to create this relatively simple uh, maze and what they want the robot to do is to race around and around the maze. So circle through the maze as quickly uh, as possible and do not hit any of the walls. Before we can construct a fitness function, we need to know what, uh, what variables we have available to build this function. Uh, like the Breitenberg vehicles we've seen before, this robot has two wheels and we'll assume that there is two motor neurons, which you can actually see, uh, you can see here in the neural network. So we've got our two wheels. Here are the two output neurons of our neural network. These are our two motor neurons and they send values to the two motors. They're going to apply an activation function that squashes the values 
arriving at the two output neurons to values that range between minus 5 and 0.5. They're going to treat the values arriving at the motors as desired velocities. So uh, last time we talked about position control and you're going to be implementing position control this week in assignment four where the number arriving at the motor neuron is meant to represent a desired position or if we're using a hinge joint, the desired angle, right? We talked about this last time. There is a uh, velocity control, sorry, velocity control, um, which as the name implies is we, st we still have numbers arriving at the motor neurons, but we're gonna interpret them differently. We're gonna send them to the motors and tell them that these are desired velocities rather than desired positions or angles. So uh, minus 0.5 could be, uh, it could be, uh, it could be radians per second, it could be angles per second, it doesn't matter. It's some, uh, some angle per uh, unit time. Okay, so a desired rotational velocity of zero means don't rotate the motors at all. We're going to assume that 0.5 means rotate the wheels forward at 0.5 radians per second. A value arriving of minus 0.5 means uh, apply a torque, try and rotate the motors to reach a desired velocity of minus 0.5 radians per second. So the simple Kepra here, we've got two motor neurons controlling the motors and they're controlling them using velocity control. If you play around with PyBullet, you can see that you can, uh, you can send commands to uh, your joints that will control them with position control or velocity control. Okay, so we've got our two motor neurons. On this particular Kepra, they set up uh, eight proximity sensors, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Eight. A proximity sensor sends out an infrared pulse, an infrared beam, and then determines how long it takes for that infrared light to return. The longer it takes for that, be that uh, pulse of infrared light to return, the further away whatever object it was that the infrared beam collided with. So uh, these are very simple proximity or infrared sensors that give a, a sense of distance. Okay, so we've got uh, two motor neurons and associated with each of the eight motors, we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight sensor neurons. So we have eight sensor neurons and two motor neurons. You can see that the network itself is drawn in kind of a strange way because they're embedding this network directly in uh, the robot. So here's the input layer. These eight white circles are eight uh, our eight sensor neurons, and all of them, uh, each of the each of the eight sensor neurons has two outgoing synapses that connect it to the two motor neurons. So there are no hidden uh, no hidden neurons here. So we have a total of two times sorry eight times two equals sixteen synapses. So in the evolutionary robotics experiment, they're going to actually here it's drawn a little bit easier to see. Here they're going to evolve uh, vectors of length 16, encoding the 16 synaptic weights, and each set of uh, each vector of 16 values determines how the eight proximity sensors are going to influence the values arriving at the motor neurons. So far, so good. Okay. So now we want to construct a fitness function, which we're going to represent with phi here. Um, we're going to make a few assumptions just to keep things simple for now. We're going to assume that uh, we're going to construct this, fitness, this function as a function of these uh, as a function of these ten values. So we're going to assume that we have or we have ten variables. We have the values of the eight infrared sensors, or the I there, or the input sensors. And we have a ninth and tenth variable, which is we're going to assume that we can just record uh, the values of the motor neurons. As you'll see as we continue on in this class, we can construct fitness functions using different uh, variables, but usually we construct the fitness function as a function of the sensors. So the robot can in essence sense how well it's doing. Okay. All right, so let's start with the second one here, does not hit walls. How might you construct a term here using these variables so that 
Uh, the further the robot stays from the walls, the higher this value is. We're going to assume that higher values of phi, higher values of fitness are better, and lower values of phi, lower fitness is worse. What might be some candidate equations for that? If you have an idea, go ahead and type it into chat. Remember that the, value, the variables i1 through i8 can take on values between 0 and 1. An infrared sensor that reports a value, a very high value, close to one, means there is an object very close to that sensor. And a value, uh, a value approaching zero means there is an object further and further away. And if there is an object five or more centimeters away from that infrared sensor, it reports a value of zero. Forget about moving, forget about moving in the maze for a moment. Let's assume we just want to evolve uh, neural network controllers for our robot so that they stay as far from the walls of this maze as possible. What might be a good fitness function for that? One way to start thinking about this is to mentally pick up this Kepra robot and place it at different places inside this maze or this racetrack. I'll put this picture back up here for a moment. You can imagine, let's assume that this is the front of the robot. Actually, it doesn't really specify what's the front or the back. If we placed the front of the robot up against one side of the maze, then these infrared sensors are probably reporting values near one. These are probably reporting intermediate values and the two back sensors, which are maybe up against this wall facing back towards this wall are reporting values very low near uh, zero. So as Alex says, obviously the idea would be we wanna try and construct some function where we uh, keep the proximity sensors from maintaining low values. So assuming uh, we're going to use I1 through I8 here to build our fitness function, what might that be? Imagine we have the Kepra here and it's facing head on, it's bumped head on against this little uh, stub in the middle of the maze. That might mean that one or two of these very front sensors are reporting high values, but the rest are reporting values very near zero. So that seems very good. Most of the values are near zero, but there is one or two sensors that are reporting high values. That's no good. What might be a good function for this? We could take the mean, right? So if we just put the mean in here and we evolved uh, and we involved robots uh, to maximize phi, that would actually be disastrous. That'd be the opposite of what we wanted. If, if, if a high value of phi is good, taking the mean would be bad because a neural network would evolve that drives the robot into the wall so that most of the sensors are reporting very high values. So we could take, uh, we could take uh, the negative of the mean, or actually that doesn't work because we need values between zero and one. So we could try, for example, one over one plus uh, mean I1 through I8. There's one idea. So that would, that equation there, if all of the uh, I's were equal to uh, zero, that would be the best thing. That would give us one over one plus zero equals one. That's excellent. If the values are very high, that's gonna give us a value near zero. However, what we would probably want is again, something that, uh, let's try this. We don't really care about the average so much. We don't want it to collide. So we don't want any of the eight values to ever uh, approach one. So even if one of the sensors is reporting one and all the others are reporting zero, that's as bad as most, if not all of the proximity sensors reporting a one. Okay, so we can start to construct a term like that. What might be another term that we would include in this function that rewards for circling through the maze as fast as possible? 
And again, we have these eight variables at our, uh, at our disposal. How might you construct a function using these 10 variables that if a neural network causes the robot to circle through the maze, cycle around this track as quickly as possible, phi would approach one. If it stays still and doesn't go anywhere, phi would approach zero. If you have an idea, go ahead and type it into chat. So we're probably, we don't need to use the proximity sensors uh, in this case. Obviously VL and VR are going to be important. How might we combine VL and VR to select for behaviors that cause the robot to race through this, through this uh, track as quickly as possible? Any ideas? What happens if we just take the sum of VL and VR? Imagine we plug, okay, Missy says VL plus VR. So we could just plug VL and VR in there and that would maximize, uh, that would maximize for speed. If we put VL plus VR in there in phi alone, what would happen? If we just had phi equals VL plus VR, and we evolved neural networks to maximize phi, what would we get? What behavior would we get? Exactly, right? We'd get something that would go straight and crash into the walls. So we want to try and combine VL plus VR with one of the, one of the terms here we constructed for uh, for staying away from the walls, how might you combine these two terms? Okay, so we could multiply them together. So this is pretty close to what, uh, what the investigators came up with. So they actually multiplied not two terms together, but three, but they're pretty close to what we have here. Um, first of all, let's start with V. So they're gonna try and maximize V. They take the absolute value of VL plus VR rather than just summing them, which is kind of odd. Why might they do that? Well, as Missy mentioned, we could just use VL plus VR. That's perfectly fine. But we've built in an assumption in that case, which is that we want the robot to circle through the maze forward as quickly as possible. One of the aims of evolutionary robotics is to try and evolve robots to do what we want, in, but specify as little as possible how they should do it. We wanna make as little assumptions as possible. The robot, remember the wheels can spin forward and back. The robot has sensors on its front and its back. So it doesn't really matter to us whether it races around, uh, around the maze forward clockwise or races around backwards counterclockwise. So by building in absolute values, um, they, give, they give evolution the option to discover whether to drive the robot forward or back. But this, although it does sum between zero and one, which is good, introduces a problem, which is that you could maximize V by setting VL to plus 0.5 and setting VR to minus 0.5. Forget these other two terms for a moment. What would that cause the robot to do? If we just set phi equal to absolute VL plus absolute VR, what would the robot do? It would obviously spin in place, right? So by taking a step back and not telling the robot it has to drive forward, it can choose to go through the maze forward or backward. We've introduced a bit of a problem, which is a problem known as perverse 
instantiation. This is a problem we're going to see many, many times throughout this course, and this is a very real problem in robotics. If we specify in a vague sense, like uppercase V, what we would like the robot to do and we train it to do it, there are often solutions that maximize the fitness function or the objective function or the loss function for talking about machine learning. There are many ways for the agent to, to, uh, to come up with a good solution that maximizes that function, but the behavior that maximizes that, behavior, that function is perverse. It's not what we wanted. So spinning in place gets 100% perfect score, but it's not what we wanted. I'm guessing um, that the researchers initially put in just V and a third and a second term, like we mentioned, for for avoiding the walls, got perverse instantiation. They evolved a robot that spun in place. So they added this second term here, and we'll just break this down by a moment by looking at this variable uh, delta V inside this term. You can see that delta V is maximized. I'm sorry, delta V is minimized when the difference between the velocity of the left wheel and the velocity of the right wheel are as close as possible. Taking one minus delta V means that this second term approaches one when both wheels uh, are, spinning, are spinning in the same direction and approaches zero when they're spinning in opposite directions. So V says maximize uh, speed. The second term says maximize the similarity of velocity of the wheels. Last little detail here, you'll see that they take the square root of delta V. If you think about delta V on a horizontal axis and the square root of delta V on the vertical axis, you may remember that the square root curve for positive values has this sort of logarithmic or um, uh, uh, becoming increasingly horizontal as it goes. What that means is that by taking the square root, there's a strong weight or a strong penalty for uh, even slight differences between delta Vs. So adding in the square root is sort of putting increasing evolutionary pressure to say don't even have a small delta V. You want those values to be as close to one another as possible. It's a bit of a detail that's not so important for us. Maximize velocity, maximize the similarity of velocity between uh, the Vs. And then we have a third term here, 1 minus I, where I here represents the maximum firing of any of the eight sensors. So we came up with 1 over 1 plus something. You could also do, we could do 1 over 1 plus X. Um, if you ever see that in a fitness function, that means obviously they're trying to minimize or penalize X, assuming X is a positive value. If you see just X, they're trying to reward or maximize the value of x. Another way, obviously, to do this is 1 uh, minus x, which works just fine if x ranges between 0 and 1, which it does in our case. Okay, so they're multiplying these three terms together. So they're trying to evolve the robot that does three things. Go fast, maintain uh, a straight heading, either forward or back, and stay away from the walls. Okay. Again, I apologize for the quality of this image. This is a pretty old paper at this point. So on the horizontal axis here, they have evolutionary generations. They had a population of neural networks. And remember that they have to drop each neural network one after the other onto the robot and evaluate how it does. One generation took 40 minutes to evaluate each neural network in the population at that generation. They did about 100 generations, which was 66 hours, or it took them about three days to do uh, this experiment. As you can kind of guess from looking at this experiment, it's not perfectly autonomous. You can't just turn it on and let it run for three days. Someone had to sit with it, make sure the robot uh, was doing what it was supposed to be doing, that the cable didn't get tangled. They had to keep checking on the laser. This is a pretty tiring experiment to, to carry out. Okay. Uh, what you can see here, again, I'm sorry it's so blurry, um, what you're seeing in this lower curve here, this is the average fitness, the average fee of each uh, 
of each neural network in the population, and you can see that it's growing over time. So evolution is making progress. It's producing faster and faster robots that maintain straighter and straighter headings while staying away from the walls. The higher curve here is the maximum. This is the, uh, the fee value of the neural network in the population, of the best neural network in the population at that time, where best is the neural network that has the highest value of phi. Okay, so not bad. Um, and then at the end, what they're showing here, this is a visualization of the best neural network they obtained after three days. Uh, each of these little line segments represents where the robot is and its heading. And you can see it driving along here and then turning uh, to its left, continuing down here getting into a little bit of a corner, um, slowing down and turning very quickly and then heading straight and around and around it goes. So it seems more or less about uh, as optimal as you could probably do in this, in this task. This doesn't really tell us how fast or how close to the uh, fastest speed the Kepra is driving. Here's the same data, but it's now broken out into these three fitness terms. Here's V, 1 minus I, and 1 minus the square root of delta V. Remember that higher values of V mean that the robot is traveling faster. Higher values of 1 minus I mean that it's staying further away from the walls. And higher values of 1 minus square root of delta V, v of delta V mean the wheels are turning increasingly uh, at increasingly similar velocities. You'll notice at the beginning, V, which is the, uh, the solid line, is pretty low. The robot is moving very uh, slowly, but it's doing a pretty good job of staying away from the walls and maintaining about the same speed of the motors, which obviously is easy to do if you're not moving very quickly. As evolution proceeds, the robot is traveling faster, and the other two terms are actually incurring increasing penalties. These terms are actually decreasing in value over evolutionary time a little bit. As you start moving, it obviously becomes increasingly difficult to stay away from the walls at all times. And it may, if you're traveling at a faster velocity, it's harder to keep those two velocities of the two wheels uh, very close to one another. So this is a nice visual reminder that, um, as we're going to see in many more experiments, we often ask evolution to simultaneously optimize uh, multiple behaviors or different features of a given behavior. And evolution has to try and balance all of these things. And often there is no perfect solution. There is no way for evolution to discover a neural network that maximizes everything we ask it to do. It's going to have to strike a trade-off between these competing uh, features. And how evolution strikes that trade-off is another big challenge in evolutionary robotics, which we'll come back to uh, later in the course. Okay. Um, I won't spend too much time talking about this. You can have a look at this in the reading. Uh, they tried to create a, a fancy picture here where they have three axes representing the values of the three fitness terms. And we can then look at the trajectory of evolutionary progress in this three-dimensional space where each point represents uh, an evolved neural network. For a, single, uh, for a single neural network, as the robot is moving through the maze at each point in time during the behavior of that uh, produced by that single neural network, they can take different values of how fast the robot is moving, how far it stays away from the walls, and how straight it drives. Okay, I do wanna take a moment to talk about uh, this image or this pair of images, images. Let's come back to the neural network for a moment. Remember, here's our eight sensor neurons and here's our two motor neurons. You can see that they've drawn in the synapses. And if you look carefully at the arrow heads, you'll see that there are triangles which represent excitatory connections. And there are uh, these, um, these little fletches here which represent inhibitory connections. So in this case, the, uh, the experimenters evolved the synaptic weights, but they set, uh, they set the sign of the synapses. So they set 
uh, um, whether these values were interpreted as positive values or negative values. And they set ipsilateral connections. Remember, ipsilateral is same side connections. They set these to be that these had to be positive values. And they set contralateral connections. They fix these to be negative numbers. So the magnitudes of these 16 weights was evolved by evolution, but the sign of these 16 weights was set by the experimenters. They were giving the experimenters a little, uh, they were giving evolution a bit of a hint or restricting it to a subset of all possible values for these 16 weights. Why? Why set ipsilateral connections to be excitatory and inhibitory uh, and, and contralateral connections to be inhibitory? What does that generally cause the robot to do regardless of what the magnitude of these values are? So this doesn't have to do with symmetry yet. Evolution could still evolve asymmetric magnitudes for these 16. We've already seen some robots that had contralateral uh, inhibitory connections and excitatory ipsilateral connections. What does that tend to cause the robot to do? There's a very strong hint on this slide. Any ideas? To turn, turn away from the walls, right? So as you can tell from up here, these experimenters took a page uh, from Breitenberg's uh, book. Excitatory ipsilateral connections mean more light falling on the right, for example, and more light. So more proximity falling on the right, more proximity meaning objects that are closer, more proximity means more turning of the same side wheel, which means turning away from proximal objects. Uh, lots of proximity on the right means lots of inhibition of the wheel on the left, meaning the wheel will turn in the, will slow down or even turn in the opposite direction and help with the turning away from the walls. The rate and how it should turn away from the walls uh, is up to evolution by evolving the magnitude. And we can see that this is important because in this, exper in this uh, case here, um, you can see the width of the, the lines here. These are The width of the line is meant to represent the magnitude of the synaptic weight, how far from zero that weight is. The thicker the line, the further away from zero it is. We have some thick uh, inhibitory and excitatory connections, so strong uh, high magnitude positive values and high magnitude negative values. So by setting these values manually, so instead of using evolution, they went in and set these values and they set them to be symmetric. So they're actually constructing by hand a Breitenberg type vehicle it doesn't work so well and they show why if you take a robot with bilaterally by uh, with bilaterally symmetric connections so the strength of a weight on one side is equal to the strength of the corresponding weight on the other side the robot if it's facing into a corner will get stuck it will start to drive uh, into the corner and because this is done in reality one of these two walls is going to be very slightly closer to the robot than the other, so the robot will turn a little bit away from that slightly closer wall. The moment it does, it's now closer to the other wall, turns back a little bit, back, 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 and comes to a standstill. Evolution never evolved bilaterally symmetric connections. They were asymmetric, which seems like a non-intuitive solution. Many things in nature, like us, are bilaterally symmetric. The left side of our body looks like the right side of our body. But there are also cases where asymmetry is useful, like you can see here. They took one of the evolved individuals and put it in the exact same position facing into the corner. And this one was able to, to as it started to drive into the corner, escape the corner. 
So this is, a, again, a simple demonstration, but a nice demonstration of the fact that evolution often comes up with non-intuitive solutions. If I gave you this robot with this set of syn uh, 16 synapses, and I told you we want the robot to circle through the maze and not hit the walls, most of us would probably, whatever we set these values to, we'd probably set them to bilaterally symmetric connections, not knowing any better. Evolution can see more than we can. It's so a famous phrase uh, from evolutionary biology, and I, th I think it's apocryphal. I don't know if it's actually true, but the phrase is evolution is smarter than you are, meaning that whatever solution you think works for a given situation, uh, biological evolution, or in our, ca our case, uh, an evolutionary algorithm can often come up with a better solution. That's why we're using it. Okay. Last mystery that arose from this, uh, or sorry, one, one uh, interesting mystery that arose from this uh, experiment is they did, get, they did get a robot that cycled through the maze, but this particular solution caused the robot to cycle through the maze at a maximum speed of 48 meters, millimeters per second. But the top speed of the wheels, if the wheels were turning at 0.5 radians per second, if both wheels were turning forward at 0.5 radians per second, that would cause the robot to move at 80 millimeters per second. Why did evolution not find a neural network that caused the robot to cycle through the maze at 80 millimeters per second? Any ideas? So 80 millimeters per second, um, for those of you not that familiar with the metric, uh, with the metric system, uh, some, ge some good guesses here. Um, it's harder to control turning at higher speeds, possibly. Uh, it wasn't advantageous because it increased the odds of running uh, into the wall, loss of control. There was not enough runway to achieve top speed. So Alex, that's a good observation. So there's something about momentum here. It might need to slow down for the turns. Uh, so it's possible. So maybe at 80 millimeters per second, as it took the curve, it might flip over. That's not the case. 80 millimeters per second is not, not too fast. Uh, it, it doesn't necessarily lose control. So if I gave you a remote control and you practiced for a couple hours or a couple days, you could probably drive you could probably drive the Kepra through this maze at 80 millimeters uh, per second. Missy actually has the right answer here. The speed of the sensors, the speed at which the sensors react is too slow compared to the robot's top speed. So the infrared sensors, uh, they work by updating themselves every uh, uh, every um, uh, intermittently. I don't know what the refresh rate is of these sensors. But whatever the refresh rate was, 48 millimeters per second was about as fast as the robot could drive and keep from crashing into the walls. So somebody mentioned uh, it's harder to control turning. Uh, and Logan said it wasn't advantageous uh, about running into the walls, right? So the speed of the motors is actually being set based is being evolved in response to a physical limitation of the robots, which is the refresh rate of the sensors. If I told you the refresh rate of the sensors that they refresh three times per second, I don't know about you, but I wouldn't be able to work backwards from that to know that 48 millimeters per second is as fast as we could program the robot to go and correctly use the infrared sensors to avoid the walls. Again, evolution is smarter than we are. Okay, so let's. Uh, that's that was the uh, experiment carried out by our, our Italian researchers in Switzerland. So let's jump over the English Channel to uh, the UK and the University of Sussex. So at about the same time, some English researchers were constructing a, another physical robot, and they also used an evolutionary algorithm to evolve this robot to do something interesting. As you can already see by looking at this cartoon in the top left, this robot is very different from the Kepra robot and almost doesn't seem like a robot at all. So they took a table and they cut out, uh, they cut out the inside of the table. 
They then placed an X trolley. They put a, 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 this trolley that could drive uh, left and right along the top of this table. On top of the X trolley, they put a smaller Y trolley. I don't know if I can do this with my hands. Well, maybe you can just sort of see from the cartoon. The Y trolley would drive forward and back along the length of the X trolley while the X trolley was moving left and right along the table. Okay. Like the other experiment, uh, they had a robot here that was connected by a cable to the, the computer. The computer is going to evolve neural networks, and each neural network in turn is going to have a chance at controlling the X trolley, the Y trolley, and this part of the robot that hangs down from the Y trolley. Um, again, I apologize for the poor quality of the, uh, the picture here, but what we actually have here is a camera that's pointing downwards, and it's pointing downwards towards a small round dental mirror that you can see here. This mirror is tilted at 45 degrees, and there is a little motor underneath the mirror that can turn, that can rotate the motor, uh, sorry, can rotate the mirror around and around and around. So what you actually have here is an upside down periscope. Um, so the robot is basically under the table. From the robot's point of view, it is under the table near the ground and it is looking horizontally around itself. So this robot with this rotating, uh, rotating mirror actually has a 360 degree view horizontally around itself under the table. Okay. Why build such a crazy contraption? Remember, we haven't said much about the task, but you can sort of see from the little, uh, the little toys underneath here, they're going to evolve it to sort of locomote and look around, uh, to move around and, and look at things. Why set this up in such a crazy manner? Any ideas? So like, uh, like our Italian researchers, they're going to evolve hundreds and maybe thousands of neural networks. They're going to try out one after the other on this gantry robot. And for each neural network, they're going to assign a value, or the computer is going to assign a value based on how well uh, that neural network did. Why build things like this? If I go back for a moment to the Kepper experiment, at the end, uh, at the end of each neural network evaluation, once the robot, once the neural network had finished controlling the robot, someone had to reach in and pull the Kepper back to the starting position. Otherwise, the second neural network that's about to be evaluated might have an unfair advantage or an unfair disadvantage. They want to make sure that the initial conditions for each neural network are the same. They had to do this by hand for three days with the Kepra robot. The gantry robot, after one neural network had been evaluated, they could send commands to the X trolley and the Y trolley that would move everything back to the, the same initial conditions. This experiment, they also run, ran for uh, several days, but it could run unattended. Okay, that's why. All right, so that's the robot. Let's talk about the sensors and motors for this robot. Um, let's start with the sensors. Uh, I mentioned the rotating mirror under here. They also had this uh, circular piece of plastic underneath. And if the, if the periscope, downward periscope bumped into something, uh, that, that piece of plastic would rotate, and there's a sensor right in here that would detect the angle of rotation. So if we look at, uh, if we look at uh, th this piece of plastic from above, they took those angles and they, uh, the angles of deflection, if it, if it bumped into anything, and they, uh, they re-encoded it as uh, a binary vector of four numbers. So a one indicates that the plastic disc had been hit from front left. A zero here means it had not been hit from the front left. A one here means the plastic disc had been bumped from the back right, back left, front left, and so on. 
So the, this vector is being updated once, I think, uh, once or twice uh, every second. So they're getting tactile or bump information. So this is almost like the proximity sensors we just saw in the Kepra robot, but a little bit simplified. So we've got four sort of virtual sensors so far. These four virtual sensors are binary. You just created three binary touch sensors in your virtual robot. This robot has three additional sensors up here, and I'm going to describe how these uh, how these sensors work. Remember our rotating camera underneath. So that rotating camera underneath produces a 360 degree view. So if we imagine it constructing a a JPEG or a, a, an image down here. Uh, it, uh, pixels towards uh, the top represent ob things seen to the north of the robot underneath the table. So uh, let's say this direction is north, west, east, and south. So we've got this picture underneath, which is again a horizontal, a 360 degree view of the robot underneath. They do a little bit of scaling and manipulation of this to turn it into a circular image. They then place uh, circle, three circles at different positions into this image. This is still a JPEG, if you like. It's still a, a pixel array of what the robot, of what this downward facing camera saw. They're going to place these three uh, circles, and they are going to define uh, the radius of the circle. And I'll describe how they do that in a moment. These are known as uh, fovea. We have fovea as well, which are sort of points in our visual field where we focus, where things, where we can see things most clearly. So you can obviously see things out in your peripheral vision, but they're very blurry. You can't see any detail until you look directly at them. And now that image is falling onto the center of the back of your eye, which is your fovea. In our gantry robot, it is going to have three different fovea. It can see, it can see stuff inside these three circles. Everything that is outside these three circles, it cannot see at all. It's completely blind. Inside each of these three fovea, they throw away all the color information. They just take the grayscale values. So now we have a circular JPEG um, of, grayscale, of gray pixels, grayscale valued pixels. They take all the pixels inside the first fovea and take the average brightness. They take all the pixels inside the second circle, take the average brightness, and do the same thing with the third circle. So they now have three numbers, the average brightness inside these three fovea. The final step is they scale these to integers between 0 and 15. Why 0 and 15? Why did they use integers rather than floats? Why did they use three fovea rather than take the average brightness of the entire image? They were limited in 1994 by uh, uh, many hardware limitations. We won't go into the details. They're basically uh, giving the robot a subset of visual information that it's collecting from the camera. Okay, so every time step, during every time step that uh, the gantry robot moves, it's getting seven integer values. Four of them are binary. The other three range between zero and 15. So far, so good? Okay. Uh, Okay, so uh, we have seven sensors and we have three ways of moving. So we have two, uh, two motor neurons. One, the value is going, uh, positive values is gonna drive the X trolley towards positive X. Negative values of the first motor neuron are gonna drive the X trolley in the opposite direction. So the first, first motor neuron is controlling the X trolley. Second motor neuron is controlling the Y trolley. The third way of moving, which is to rotate the tilted mirror, that they just set to rotate at a constant rate so they could construct this pixel array at every time step. So for, the ro for our purposes, this robot has seven sensors and seven sensor uh, neurons. 
and two motor neurons, one driving the X trolley, the other driving the Y trolley. Where do these three, uh, so we're going to evolve weights connecting the seven sensors to the two motors like we saw, uh, like we saw before. There are uh, nine additional numbers that are going to go into the genome. So we have uh, seven. We have seven sensor neurons. We have seven sensor sensor neurons times two motor neurons give us fourteen synaptic weights that we need to evolve, plus nine uh, additional genes. What do these additional uh, nine genes do? The first three, uh, the first three nine numbers represent the x and y position of the first fovea and its radius. So x1, y1, and r1. So we're going. So the genome is actually going to evolve where the first fovea is placed and how big it is. The second set of three numbers, as you can probably guess by now, the second set of those three numbers is the x, y, and radius of the second fovea. And the seventh, eighth, and ninth additional gene represent the X and Y and radius of the third fovea. So everything we've seen up to this point, evolution has been evolving uh, just the brain, just the synaptic weights. Now we are starting to see the evolutionary algorithm being expanded to start to take control of the physiology or the anatomy of the robot. It's a very modest step we or the, the British researchers built and designed everything else except these last few details about where these fovea should be placed. So in essence, evolution can determine where in its visual field the gantry robot focuses its attention. Okay, any questions about that before we move on? So far so good? Okay. So we just talked about sensors, motors, the fovea. Let's talk about uh, phi, the fitness functions. Um, in this case, it's functions plural. In this experiment, they used an incremental approach where they performed evolution. In the first third of the evolutionary algorithm, they used one fitness function. The second, then they continued evolution um, using a different fitness function, and then they finished evolution using a third fitness function. So the first third of the ge evolutionary generations were done using phi one, second third of generations done with phi two, the third third of the generations were performed with phi three. They're going to start by evolving neural networks. They're going to start to evolve, uh, sorry, I'm going to say they evolve robots because we're now not just evolving neural networks anymore. We're evolving the fovea or parts of the robot as well. So they were evolving populations of robots to perform a simple task, which was just approach the back wall underneath the table. They painted the wall behind the table. They, there was a, uh, or they put a piece of Bristol board here, cardboard. They painted it all black. And the only thing the gantry robot had to do is wherever they initially placed the X and Y trolley, whatever initial position the upside down periscope had, it had to drive towards the back black wall. So you can see in my little cartoon here, I have uh, two, I have one position, and this gantry robot drove towards the back wall represented by the arrow. They took the same, uh, they then took the, they commanded the trolley to move the periscope to this position, and they re-ran, they re-ran the same neural network with the same fovea from this position and evaluated how well it also drove towards the back wall. So this is something else we're going to see as we move on now. If you have a genome and you want to evaluate the fitness of that genome on the robot, you might download that genome onto the robot multiple times and watch the robot uh, perform under different conditions multiple times and construct a fitness function that rewards the average behavior of that robot. Okay. Once they were able to evolve a robot to move towards the back wall, regardless of where the robot uh, started from, they switched in, they swapped out a more complex, uh, a more complex fitness function, 
where now they placed a piece of white bristol board behind, uh, behind and underneath the table, and there was a black rectangle either on the right side of the white bristol board, like you see here, or they put in a different piece of bristol board where there was black uh, on the left and the white bristol board on the right. So regardless of where this rectangle was, and again, regardless of where the robot started from, it always had to drive towards the black rectangle, wherever the black rectangle was placed. Once the robot had evolved the ability to recognize and drive towards the black rectangle, they swapped in a third and final fitness function, which was a piece of Bristol board that had either a rectangle on the right and an, a triangle on the left, or a rectangle on the right and a triangle on the, sorry, a black rectangle on the left and a triangle on the right. Regardless of which piece was swapped in and regardless of the initial position of uh, the robot, it was supposed to always drive so that it would avoid the back rectangle and go towards the back triangle. Okay. So let's have a look at what these fitness functions actually were. The first one, uh, Phi1, they're gonna evaluate uh, the fitness of one robot by evaluating that robot four times. In my little cartoon here, I'm only showing two, just for simplicity. I equals one to four, so over four trials, how did the robot do? At the end of each of the four trials, they computed YI, which was the distance of the robot from the opposite wall, from the front wall. It seems kind of odd, but by just doing that, um, the higher YI means the higher it was from the front wall, which means the closer it was to the back wall. It's always easier to think about higher values of phi being better, more fit. Okay, so basically just go towards the back wall. Um, phi two, at the end of each of the four trials, they measured DI, which was the distance of the camera or the periscope from the uh, center of the back rectangle. So here now they have to put in a negative sign. So the highest possible value that phi two can take is zero. In all four trials, the distance between the camera and the center of the black rectangle is zero. Yeah, okay, not, not that difficult. Okay, third and final fitness function here uh, is we're gonna, again, sum over four trials, and we're gonna compute two terms, alpha minus beta. Um, forget about alpha and beta for a moment. Let's just look at these two terms. You can see the first term is a collection of D1s, and the second term is a collection of D2s. D1 represents the distance. Uh, the di D1 represents the distance of the rectangle, uh, distance between the camera and the rectangle. D2, the distance of the camera and the triangle. You can see that the second term has a negative sign in front of it, so we are trying to minimize the second term and maximize the first term. We want to minimize the second term, which is minimize the D2s. Minimize the distance of the periscope from the triangle. And we want to maximize the D1s. We want to maximize the distance of the camera from the rectangles. Okay, you can see we have uppercase D and lowercase D. This was just to try and normalize based on the initial starting position of the camera. It's a little detail that we won't worry about too much. So far, so good. Okay, so they ran evolution, evolved the gantry robot to go towards the back wall. Step two, continue evolving those robots so that at least one of those robots uh, goes towards the back rectangle. Continue evolution so that we evolve robots that move away from the rectangle and towards the triangle. Here's the best solution that they got. Let's look, we're now looking down through the table. You can see uh, one, two, three, four here. These are the four starting positions of the periscope. In this case, the triangle was back left and the rectangle was back right. And you can see how the periscope moved. So at this point, the periscope was sort of facing towards uh, was sort of, or sorry, was here, was sort of facing towards the back wall, turned, 
this camera is whizzing, the mirror is whizzing underneath, the robot is sort of turning around and around and around, goes as far as it can go away from the triangle and then heads straight from the, for the triangle. Um, uh, sorry, I had that wrong. One, two, three, four starting positions. If we look at the fourth starting position over here, the robot is sort of heading towards the triangle, but is rotating as it goes. Does a couple of rotations and then heads straight for the triangle. Over here, it heads straight for the triangle. And in this case, it heads actually towards the rectangle, turns a little bit, and heads towards the triangle. So whatever the evolved uh, robot is, in this case, it's clearly doing a good job of going towards the triangle. It's not perfect, it's not optimal, it doesn't turn and head straight for the triangle, but it's pretty good. Uh, last thing I want to talk about, last detail about this experiment I want to talk about is a little bit subtle. It's a little bit, takes a little bit to wrap your mind around, but it is extremely important. In my estimation, in this entire course, this neural network, which we're going to talk about in a moment, is the best example of embodied cognition. Okay, off we go. Over, We have a picture here of a neural network. Uh, on the left-hand side here, there should be seven sensor neurons. They did not draw the additional five sensor neurons because they were not used by uh, evolution. So some of the synaptic weights that are flowing from the uh, sensor neurons to the motor neurons, those, uh, those synapses were never used. The values of those synapses, the values of the weights of those synapses, evolution moved them so close to zero. It was in effect, that synapse was in effect no longer there. So to simplify this picture, they just didn't draw that synapse. If there is a sensor neuron that is sending out a bunch of synapses and the weights of all of those synapses are basically near zero, then that means that that, that sensor has no influence on the behavior of the robot. They did not draw that sensor either. So uh, we'll ju we're just focusing on the seven sensor neurons for a moment. The behavior of this robot was dependent on two of the seven sensors. What were those two? They were two of the fovea. There was a third fovea that actually exists in the genotype, but that fovea has no influence on the robot's behavior. Evolution evolved these two fovea to be at these two positions in the robot's visual field and, uh, you, and evolved the radius of these two fovea to be as you see in this, uh, in this picture. Okay. Who knows why evolution placed these fovea here? It's not clear yet, but let's uh, carry on. You'll notice um, that there are, uh, there are synapses that are flowing to the left motor and the right motor. These are not named uh, very well. These are, uh, these are the, uh, the left and right is the control of the X trolley and the Y trolley. This is a little bit of a, an error in notation here, I think. The third motor neuron here is controlling the spinning of the, of the mirror. And I realize now that I misspoke earlier. So there are three motor neurons. Uh, the third motor neuron does control the rotation of the tilted mirror. My apologies, I forgot to, I forgot to mention that, that fact. Okay, so it can control that mirror, it can control where it's, it's looking. You'll notice that there are also some hidden neurons in here. Remember, hidden neurons are hidden from the real world. They can't directly uh, get information from the world. They can only get information indirectly from sensor neurons. They also do not directly influence the world. They can only influence the world indirectly by sending values to the motor neurons. Okay. You'll notice there's some solid lines and some dashed lines. So the solid lines are excitatory connections and the dashed lines are inhibitory connections. 
You'll also notice that there are not only arrows that are flowing from the sensors to the motors or from the sensors, from a sensor neuron to a motor neuron, a uh, hidden neuron, and then another synapse connecting a hidden neuron to a motor neuron, hidden to motor, sensor to hidden. You'll also see there are some synapses that are flowing backwards and around and around, and there's even a self synapse. There is one, a synapse that goes out from a neuron and reattaches to this neuron. If you go back, if you recall our discussion about uh, neural networks, we actually talked about uh, these particular kind of synapses. What are they? What are they called? Does anybody remember? So these are recurrent connections. Um, you can also think about, um, it's also sometimes referred to, these synapses are referred to as uh, synapses that flow from sensors towards motors. They might arrive at mo uh, hidden neurons first and then continue on. Those are feed forward synapses. Uh, the ones flowing the opposite direction, not surprisingly, are often known as feedback connections. They're flowing sort of information back from the motors into the hidden neurons and then further upstream towards the sensor neurons. Does anybody remember when we were talking about neural networks? What do recurrent connections do? What do they give the neural network that has them? What's their, what's their function? How are they useful? So recurrent connections allow the robot to retain, allow the neural network to retain some memory. So let's just take, uh, let's take this particular recurrent connection here, which is actually a, a specific type of recurrent connection, a self connection. This synapse attaches here. So we're going to compute the value at this neuron. You'll notice that there are three incoming synapses. One two, and three. So uh, to compute the value of this neuron, we take the current value of this sensor neuron, multiply it by the weight of this synapse, plus the value of this sensor neuron, multiplied by the weight of this synapse, plus the previous value of this neuron times the weight of this synapse. Take those three terms that make up that weighted sum, squash them through the activation function and put the squashed value into this neuron. So recurrent connections use information from the previous time step, which gives the neural network some memory. So by seeing a lot of these recurrent connections, we already have our first hint about how this neural network works, which is that it remembers when it's at, for example, this point, it remembers some information from when it was at this point. When it was at this point, it remembers a bit of information from the previous moment in time, and so on. This robot, when placed in different positions, uh, turns and heads towards the triangle. It's acting as if it recognizes uh, the triangle and goes towards it, and it doesn't go towards it by driving in an arc that takes it near uh, the rectangle and towards the triangle. I don't know if you would say that it's avoiding the rectangle, but it never gets very close to the rectangle. So somehow it's discriminating between these two shapes. It knows where to go. There's another picture that you can make for the same robot in which the positions of the triangle and the rectangle are swapped. And in that case, I, I can assure you, it, it also goes towards the triangle over here and avoids the rectangle over here. Given everything we've just said about this neural network, the two of the three fovea, how is this robot able to discriminate between, or how, how is the robot first of all able to recognize triangle and recognize rectangle and decide which one to head towards? This takes quite a bit to wrap your mind around. I remember when I was a student, it took me a while to figure this out. 
One last detail I'll give you as a hint. Um, the, the image that's produced here, uh, I think actually uh, I misspoke before. I apologize. I talked about north, south, west, and east. Uh, it's not north, south, west, and east. Remember that the camera is pointing down and the uh, and the mirror is tilted at 45 degrees. So the robot is looking horizontally. So north is actually up, south is down, west is to the robot's left, and east is to the robot's right. So it's looking, uh, it's looking upright. It's not looking down on the scene. So if you take this image and you think about these two fovea, that means the robot is looking towards the back wall of uh, the back wall underneath the table and it's focusing on just the amount of uh, light or dark inside these two circles at these positions in its visual field. Where is the recognized triangle and where is the recognized rectangle? Or where is the rect recognized triangle and recognized rectangle part of these neural networks? Uh, sorry, which part of the neural network recognizes triangles and which part of the network recognizes rectangles? You might imagine, again, if you were to, to write a little algorithm to control this robot, you might write two subroutines, recognize triangle, recognize rectangle, and combine the information to determine which way the robot should move. Remember when we talked about neural networks, we constructed a neural network that computed the OR function, computed the AND function, and then combined the results of those two subfunctions to compute XOR. You could, you could, in theory, do the same thing here. You might be able to guess from the way that I've set up this question there is no recognized triangle part of this network, and there is no recognized rectangle part of this network. How does this robot know to go towards the triangle? Given everything I've told you about how this robot operates, how would it know whether it's facing the triangle or facing the rectangle? A way to start to think about this is to think about what happens is the robot is in motion. So the robot, the the um, the periscope is downwards and it's looking it's looking around itself horizontally and it's moving. As it's moving, um, it might, for example, pass. It might look at the triangle and then look away from the triangle, or it might look at the rectangle and then move away from the rectangle. Alex says, difference between V1 and V2, so difference in the brightnesses or the br difference in the values of V1 and V2 indicate a triangle. If V1 and V2 are the same, then it is looking at the triangle. Alex, you're very close, but we're missing one piece. Ah, oh, sorry. The, uh, so if v, the value of V1 and V2 are the same, it must be looking at the rectangle. So if it's facing towards the rectangle at a certain angle, that both uh, fovea 1 and 2 are inside the rectangle, both V1 and V2 are black. They're both low values. It's a good, it's a good guess, but if you look at this triangle, it's possible that v, that 1 and 2 are both inside the triangle as well. It's a very good guess, Alex. It could be the fact that one, fovea 1 and 2 do not fit inside the triangle at the same time, but they do. So your solution is very, very close, but not quite. There is a one additional piece of information that we're missing. What is it? As the robot is moving around, if you think about the values of V1 and V2, as 1 and 2 are darkening and then lightening again, as the robot sweeps over the triangle or the rectangle, they are darkening and lightening 
uh, intermittently. What is the key piece of information in that dynamic that distinguishes between the triangle and the rectangle? We've got one minute left. Let's see if you can figure it out. Remember, I'll give you a hint, remember that this robot can remember things, it can remember things for short periods of time. If you think about these two lines, or you think about these two fovea approaching, if the robot is rotating counterclockwise, it's looking to the left of this triangle and it's turning towards the right both fovea will go from light to dark at the same time. Missy says as it gets closer to the triangle, the triangle will register more of its visual field than its previous position. The rectangle, on the other hand, does not change as, at the same rate as it gets closer. At the same rate. Missy hit the nail on the head. Those two fovea will darken at the same time when the robot hits the left edge of the triangle with its two fovea. Those same two fovea, if it's to the left of the rectangle and turns towards the right, the fovea two will darken first and then fovea one will darken next. So the robot needs to remember when one or both of the fovea went dark. And by remembering, the robot can compute uh, events that have occurred at different points in time and the rate at which things happen tell the robot whether it's now looking at the triangle or looking at the rectangle. In order to solve this problem, the robot has to combine thinking. It uses the neural network. It's combining aspects of its anatomy, where its fovea are, it's combining those two pieces with its motion, the way that it moves. A robot that stays still, if the gantry robot stays still, it cannot tell the difference between the triangle and the rectangle. It has to move the fovea. Movement, thinking, and the body come together and allow this robot to distinguish between these two objects using just one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten neurons and a handful of synapses. Deep neural networks that can distinguish between triangles and rectangles have hundreds or thousands or millions of neurons. By evolution has exploited the body and the motion of this robot to solve, admittedly, a simple problem, but not that simple a problem, using very, very little brain power. That is the key to embodied cognition. I apologize, we've run two minutes over. You have a quiz uh, due tonight. You're working on assignment four. If you finish assignment four early, you can move on to assignment five, which is about refactoring. I wish you all a good rest of your day, a good rest of your week, um, and we'll see you back here next Tuesday. Bye-bye, everyone.